Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 17 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me once again is my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Welcome, dear listeners. Thank you for joining us once again. So it's been a very eventful few weeks since the last time we recorded. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, there, there have been uh, many goings on, both nationally and internationally. And uh, to that point, I think the, the guest that we've asked to join us for this episode is uh, perfectly suited to uh, frame uh, the Islamophobia conversation in terms of his role as both a storyteller in, in narrative terms and his story, role as a storyteller in journalistic terms. I'm talking, of course, about Wajahat Ali and he is a playwright, an award-winning playwright, but you probably know him better from his role as co-host of The Stream on Al Jazeera America. Uh, before he came to prominence there, he wrote The Domestic Crusaders, which is one of the first major plays about the American Muslim experience that's currently available uh, via McSweeney's. He's lead author of the investigative report Fear, Inc., The Roots of the Islamophobia Network in America, and he's currently working on a TV pilot with Dave Eggers, which uh, is about an American Muslim police officer, and he's also got another project on the way with filmmaker Joshua Seftel. So we'll be talking about both of those latter things in just a little bit. But, uh, Wajah, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, guys, for having me on your uh, podcast. I've been trying to come on for a long time. I think I'm your, I think I'm your Tony Randall. Like, uh, you probably <laughs> Reza, Reza Aslan canceled at the last second, and you're like, oh, my God. We have to go to air in three minutes. And then Zucky, Zucky texted me, and I was sitting in my pajamas, looking at, <laughs> staring, at staring at the wall, twiddling my thumbs. <laughs> maybe, maybe today. Maybe today's the moment. Maybe today's that day. See, you're describing me at on prom night, basically, every, every year. I think that's every Desi Muslim kid on prom night who, so uh, true. who so didn't true. play sports. Yeah. yeah that's, Actually, that's, that, that's right. me after marriage. So, like, and we're all married men. So, what's our excuse? It's it's incredibly sad. It's true. <laughs> You know, it's it's funny actually because because in all seriousness, uh, Wajahat, you know, I, I got yeah. I've, Wajahat. I've known him. I, how long have I known you, Wajahat? Jeez, I mean, it's it's been a while. It's been a while. Your wife has made me chai. Let's just say it's been that long. There we go. That's that's the ultimate. Uh, that's the ultimate uh, marker. And so when we started the show, I was like, in the back of my mind, I was like, I'm, I'm absolutely like, it's just a no-brainer. We're going to have Wajahat on. But yeah. I, I had my break in case of emergency because so he really was the Tony Randall. And and I just realized Wajahat that we're dating ourselves because that's a reference. That, that, that reference alone, you're dating yourself. Yeah. Basically, basically all of your listeners for the last three minutes have Wikipedia Tony Randall. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they spelled it so they don't know who we're talking about. It's, yeah, it's like, <laughs> and, like, and they probably spelled it like. R A N D E L L, you know, like after the wide receiver, they're like, what the heck is it? And then after that, they probably Wikipedia, what is odd couple? <laughs> this is how old and jaded we are. This is how pathetic we are. We're, we're dinosaurs walking on the earth. In, in, in all seriousness, you know, of course, uh, uh, we, we talk about these late night shows. It's one thing to say kids these days don't know who Johnny Carson is. That's kind of to be expected. Right. Uh, what I've encountered in my classes is kids these oh. days don't know who Jay Leno is. No, Yikes. come on, come uh, on. Yeah, swear to God, not, not making that up. So, so, yeah, so Zucky and I, for the past few years, we we always try to do the who's more irrelevant test, and <laughs> and basically what we do is uh, what Zucky <laughs> what Zucky what, what Zucky just did is like we just trade off pop cultural references. So I say, listen, man, I remember the last time this said was two years ago. I went and gave a talk to uh, my former like uh, elementary school, and I and I did a I did, I did an exquisite an exquisite name drop of, uh, I think, X-Files and Back to the Future that worked no, perfectly. And so, uh, and I just got like an ocean of blank stares. And then the teacher sitting behind me goes, they don't know. They don't know. And then like literally my weed rolls in. Yeah, yeah. And then my heart was broken. And I literally hijacked my own speech and spent six minutes teaching these kids about X-Files and Back to the Future and like lambasting them for being failures for not knowing these amazing pop culture references. And they got kind of like disturbed. I became like that ranting like, <laughs> uncle right. who like they have to tolerate, but like everyone kind of just feels pity for you. So uh, I, 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 see you, I see you as Chris Farley as that motivational speaker. He's like, but you're good. If you don't know what back to the future, you'll be in a van down by the river. <laughs> That's right. The SNL's good. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that just got Wikipedia right now too. That, Chris that, Chris that Farley. is true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, honestly, I realized that, like, we could we could do this. We could do like, this, yeah. Or you two, and I could just kind of laugh. Yeah. Pervez will be just, like, sipping his chai. Yeah. Uh, Pervez, Pervez no, is I... thinking about fick this whole time. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> where, do I, where do I get this <laughs> reputation? I don't know. And in this case, literally, that that reputation preceded me because you guys were talking about that as I joined. Um, That's true. So, well, yeah. I mean, speaking speaking about before we go to serious matters, maybe some levity is good. We were talking yeah. about how we we occupy multi hyphenated identities and how Zucky yeah. Zucky is uh, probably in probably God exists amongst the madness and chaos of life because Zucky has wasted a lot of his life in something called Planet of the Apes, the original it's version, it's not, the, not the new version. And not only Planet of the Apes, there's apparently comic books of Planet of the Apes. That's true. And Allah in his infinite mercy has, <laughs> has deemed it wise to say, you know, how can, how can I absolve Zucky of wasting his life? And Zucky is writing, if we may admit, uh, a, a chapter in a book that is, is not dedicated just to Planet of the Apes, ladies and gentlemen, that is dedicated <laughs> to the comic books of Planet of the Apes. <laughs> so there is a there is a hidden merciful hand of God in everything in it's, this universe. Well, as as I explained to Ajahith, it's it's as if it's as if you have a niche of a niche, and then yeah. within that niche, there's two more niches, and in the innermost niche, there's actually another niche. <laughs> and, and, and there's just Zucky. And, and, and it's just niche, and that's Zucky. Zucky's universe. And it's just me waving up at you. That's. <laughs> It's true. It's very, hey, you know, it's uh, God does work in mysterious ways. So, indeed, indeed. indeed. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's. I'm 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 glad that yeah, we we do have such levity right now because it's 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 almost like we we need levity to process yeah, some of the right, very right. heavy stuff that's been going on in the past week and. Right. And uh, what well, Jahath, I mean, your your role as a journalist, you're you're very much on the front lines of this. And I guess I guess you know, just by way of context, yeah. we're we're recording this show uh, mere days after an extremely tragic incident that happened in North Carolina, where you have three students uh, who were brutally killed, execution style, by a neighbor, and per you know per per the media, per the police, it was ostensibly over a parking dispute but there's there there's some questioning of, over how you know whether whether that was central to all of this and uh you know i think i think the reaction uh, to, among many that that i've seen has been a sense of even if we as american muslims do everything we're supposed to do we will never escape the cloud of suspicion and of of right of resentment or, or all the other things that go on. Uh, and, you know, and, and just while people were sort of getting over that and get, trying to, trying to make sense of that, there was also an Islamic center in Houston that was right. torched to the ground and uh, that's been deemed a total loss. And, you know, th- there is a, a sense whether rightly or wrongly that, that Islamophobia is on the rise. Now uh, I'd love uh, Wajah, to get your, your, take on that i mean is is islamophobia in fact on the rise or is this just something that uh, we're feeling well that's a loaded questions there uh, a lot to unpack but mm-hmm. before i dive into it let me tell you the definition of islamophobia that we came up with and we i mean the center for american progress that released uh an investigative report called fear incorporated the roots of the islamophobia network in america it came out in 2011 which coincided at that time with another international tragedy if your uh, listeners remember Anders Breivik the yes. Norwegian shooter who killed about 77 people and, and he said that he did it to uh, punish Europe for being too lenient on multiculturalism and Muslim immigrants and he feared the Europeanization and Islamization of Europe now he left behind a 1500 page manifesto and in right. that manifesto he cites many of the Islamophobes that we mentioned in the report who are existing and operating in America Islamophobia, in our, in, according to us, is the exaggerated fear, hatred, and hostility towards Islam and Muslims that is perpetuated by uh, negative stereotypes and misinformation leading to a bias and the marginalization, this is the key part, the marginalization of American Muslims from America's civic, political, and cultural life. Mm-hmm. What we're witnessing right now is not only the fault lines of what it means to be Muslim in America, but what I think it means to be American uh, in America, what mm. is what is America? What will America be? What is America when it has a minority majority country? What is America when it is dealing and confronting with its many minority narrative uh, narratives that exist within its borders, but oftentimes have been marginalized and excised? Are we going to be a country that lives up to its values, or mm. are we going to be a country that betrays those values? And I think the answer to that question is how we deal with one another and deal with those people who disagree with us politically, 
who look different from us ethnically and have different religious values. And I think, unfortunately or fortunately, Muslims seem to be the ones writing this. We seem to be the ones under the micro- microscope, and we seem to be the ones who are tag, you're it. Um, you know, the ones who are the boogeyman, if you will. And I just want to say that before the Muslims listen to this, listen, it seems very unique. It seems like everyone's against us. It seems that this is something foreign. But if you're a student of U.S. history, what is happening now to U.S. Muslims, even though we're in a very unique global context, mm-hmm. is the remake. This has happened before. If you look at the DNA, guys, this has happened yeah. before. Just and it's still happening there. to LGBT hmm. community, African Americans, Latinos, Japanese Americans during World War II, Irish Catholics in the 20th century and 19th century, and Jewish Americans. So mm-hmm. I think honestly, and I'll, I'll end on this point, the DNA in America, the DNA in the American values, the DNA in this rough draft multicultural experiment gives us enough, enough hope that American Muslims will also be able to emerge out of this stronger, better, and more vibrant. And inshallah, we will be able to lead America out of this to fulfill its promise and to become the country that it, it, it has, it is destined to become, inshallah. And if we fail, it, the American dream will become the American nightmare. So a lot's writing at this, and I hope I was able to give some context before we get into it. Oh, no, absolutely. I, I think you really did. Um, Wajad, I mean, you know, I, I've uh, actually sort of echoed many of the things that you said with regards to, you know, seeing Muslims uh, in terms of a historical trajectory in America of various ethnic and immigrant groups who have struggled and paid their dues, as it were. Um, you know, one of the pushbacks that I've gotten uh, from, from, from people when I do raise that issue is that, well, the... the um, the solution or not, or the end result of many of those other communities that you identified was that they were able to successfully, uh, if there, if you can call it successfully, they were able to successfully assimilate oh, yeah. entirely within the American milieu. Now, is that, is that, is that sort of the end result? Is that the only solution to combating, you know, the kind of hostility that other groups, ha- or that, 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 as I said, or as you indicated, that these minority groups have faced traditionally in America? This is a good question. L- l- before I answer it, let me get, set up some context about how we're in a unique situation. Mm-hmm. Due to 9-11 and, and due to existing uh, tensions that are exploding across the world, uh, the narrative of uh, the West versus Islam has become predominant and is used deliberately by extremists on both sides of the Atlantic, Okay. Now, as we know, there's a historical context to this. It goes back to the Crusades. Um, this, this narrative was set up primarily to justify, if you will, political and religious conflicts and to rationalize them. And then this, in turn, informed art and culture and storytelling. Before that time, it was to go back to the Crusades. Muslims, for the most part, were absent from the radar of, quote, unquote, Christianity and, quote, unquote, the West. And we could unpack that. But we saw, you know, once the Crusades started, you saw the poetry you know, uh, the, the epic poem, the Song of Roland, which made Muslims uh, the villain, right? We see right. a divine comedy uh, when it came to the Italian Renaissance of Dante, you know, who's being tortured in hell. It's the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Hazrat Ali. Ali. We, yeah. You see uh, Voltaire, an enlightened thinker, writing a play about the fanaticism of Prophet Muhammad. Um, you see 20th century, you know, Rudolf Valentino is the sheikh. You know, Zaki is a film buff. He knows this. This yep. orientalized, barbaric version of this mythical East. We saw you and, you and I growing up in the 80s, and you know we were actively rooting for Islamophobic movies because we were like, <laughs> "Yeah, Chuck Norris, kill him, kill him all in Delta Force." <laughs> right. then, you know, back yeah. you know, we, we, we used Back to the Future. Yeah, yeah. Bonnie McFly. There's no reason why all of a sudden these crazy Libyan terrorists are in this amazing movie shooting Doc. But what the hell? They're crazy. <laughs> right. uh, and and, uh, and basically, what happened was um, before 9/11. It was, quote, unquote, the West, which meant apparently America, versus this brown Middle Eastern horde, usually Arabs, usually dealing with Saudi Arabia and Palestinians. After 9-11, the same type of framework in DNA that allowed this narrative to exist uh, became a civilizational conflict with the West versus Islam. Now, that's something that has been used and abused deliberately by al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, deliberately for recruitment and successful propaganda, and it's the same one that is being used by American Islamophobes. Within this framework, what we have is unique, is we the world is now a battlefield. Non-state actors are using technology, propaganda, and weapons to, to quite literally fight unorthodox, asymmetrical wars, guerrilla warfare, right? 
the world will unfortunately see the type of attacks that we saw yesterday in Copenhagen, that we saw in France. I mean, that's going to be the norm, unfortunately. That's the reality that we live in and our kids are going to live in. And, you know, the future then, I think the onus is twofold. And some people might disagree with me. Let's focus on American Muslims. You know, I always mention this stat because I think it's pretty fascinating. There was a study that came out that around 9-11, uh, 2001, 90% of American Muslims were one of four occupations. Do you guys want to guess which they were? Well, doctor and engineer, I'm guessing, are, is 50% of that. Yeah, mm. you got two You got two out of four. Pervez, uh, want to get the other two? I, I want to say lawyer, but I doubt it. No, you uh, doubt, doubtful. Nope. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, business uh, owner, do, like, like an entrepreneur? Yeah, yeah, business. Yeah, dubious businessman who somehow makes a lot of money. Yeah. And then, and then the fourth one is taxi cab services and, and taxi drivers. Oh, wow. okay. So that leaves, that leaves 10% guys for lawyers, storytellers, journalists, academics, politicians. <laughs> and, and honestly, if you aren't telling your story, your story is being told to you by others. And it's the story right. that we mentioned, the global antagonist, the victim, the, 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 the outsider. And for Muslims, I think what, what really I throw, I, I, I take Muslims to task is despite all of our grievances and the victimization and the anger, you know, we are actually, mashallah, very well off in America. We have Absolutely. achieved the American dream. Over, I mean, there are problems, yes, but look at the stats. Look at the GDP. Look at the occupations. Right. I mean, and look at our country and look at our lives compared to Muslims living in Europe. Things are actually pretty damn good despite all the messiness, right? And oftentimes right. we see suburban people, educated people. You're from the Bay Area. I'm from Virginia. You know, people who, mashallah, have made the American dream oftentimes self-medicate on their own anger and, mm. and promote a marginalized, victimized narrative that I think is very unhealthy for us spiritually, it's unhealthy for us culturally, and it's unhealthy for our imaginations. So and well said. And, and it divorces us from not only the American experiment, but from the American society that we have actually chosen to invest in. So how do we move forward to answer your question directly? I'm not saying assimilate. But whether you like it or not, you have made a decision to live in America. Whether you like it or not, you are in this country. And whether you like it or not, you owe this country, and this country owes you. It is mutual. It goes back and forth. And as such, I don't say assimilate. I say integrate. You have, you have the ability to be a multi-hyphenate identity, but do you make the choice to be a spectator or a participant? If you're a spectator drinking your chai, looking at Bill O'Reilly cursing, nothing will get done. In, you want to respond to uh, Islamophobia? You want to respond to Fox News? You want to respond to denigrating uh, pr- uh, cartoons about our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You throw down in the ring like Musa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You throw down your stick. You exactly. outdraw them. You outsatire them. You outhustle them. You outthink them. You outwrite them. You, Bill Maher says something, go on his panel and, and show him facts. You, you throw down as a participant. You go in the ring. And as an American and as a Muslim, you own those identities and you say, you know what? I'm friggin' born in this country. The American dream belongs to me just as much as it does to you. Who are you to say this does not belong to me? Let me throw down with the best of my American and Muslim values and show to you and prove to you, even though I don't have to, that these things coexist and have coexisted and will coexist huh. long before you existed and long before I exist. Not long after I exist. Like we will throw down with the best of our values and emerge as the best, most authentic versions of ourselves, showing everyone that Islam and America are not antithetical and that our values complement each other and fuel the goodness that we do as American citizens. Absolutely. That's a, wow. that's a great <laughs> response, uh, uh, Wajahat, and I appreciate that very much. Um, you know, in fact, and one of the other points that I make, you know, kind of in response to uh, you know, some of the pushback that I get on that question of assimilation or integration is that I think America is different, right? I think the America of even as late as the 1980s is a very different America than the America that we live in today, where uh, multiculturalism, plurality, pluralism is, is generally more, more celebrated. And we don't live in that in, in the in the mode of the sort of Henry Ford, uh, you know, melt, like like melt the melting pot where everyone must assimilate and come out on the other line looking all the same. Mm. Uh, you know, there's no there's the, you know, the onus is less on the immigrant to, you know, to become anglicized and to become, you know, uh, you know, to 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 fully assimilate like that where you can mm. still maintain your uniqueness. Uh, and drawing on another analogy, you know, perhaps America is less a melting pot and more a salad bowl. It is a salad bowl. 
I don't want to melt into anything, man. Like I, right. I like my I like my limbs. I like being <laughs> a, a solid human being. Like I don't want to melt into. But I think I, I think arguably it was very different. I think there was a very different America in the early 20th century. It's a very different America in the 20th century. So, I mean, you look. It, it goes back to the, what we were saying: is what will America be? Right in the yeah, future, yeah. America yeah, is yeah, gonna, beautiful. Uh, right. America is going to be a minority majority country in three decades. It's That's happening. Right. You cannot stop it. So if and it's the beauty of America that America can can be a home of immigrants, can be out of many, one out of one many. I mean, we have, we are living the multicultural rough draft and experiment that is America, and it's the American dream that you know. And some people say it's a nightmare. Some people say it, it doesn't exist. But there's something about this American dream, guys. And I've traveled the world, mashallah. I've been very lucky to meet so many different communities. When we're talking about European Muslims, they come here and they say this: "Holy crap, you guys actually believe in this." You guys actually invest in this. You guys actually believe that you can be fully American and that America will accept you despite you having a multisyllabic name, despite your father having an accent, and despite the fact that you're Muslim. I mean, that's profound. The fact that in this country, you and I know that there's Chinese immigrants who come here, speak only two words of English, that's but they right. say, you know what? I too am an American. Yeah. And 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 to to believe in that because at the end of the day, faith. It's all about faith, right? Like you can have something, but if you have no faith in it, what does it matter? Like you can have a dollar bill worth a hundred dollars, but if we collectively as a society say we have no faith in that being a hundred dollars, it's crap. It's just worth one dollar. Then the hundred dollar bill becomes meaningless. Correct. And and so the American dream is is worth what we invest in it and what we make out of it and what we do with our actions, right? And I think there's something about American Muslims and immigrants and minorities that we still believe in this dream, the fact that we're still here. And yes, there is this fear of assimilation. But you know what? We have to confront this, guys. You have made a choice that you want to live in America. You have made a choice yeah. once you're an adult that you want to stay in America. No one is putting a gun to your head and telling you to stay here. You have profited off the education. You have profited off the infrastructure. You have profited off the relative political stability, despite all the toxicity and warts that we will talk about in the, I'm sure, in the next few minutes. And you are both investing in this, and you are both benefiting from it. So if you're going to sit right. there yeah. and hate, hate, hate all the time, which is Very fine, yeah. you know, don't be hypocritical at the same, like, you know, what are you doing as, as, as an investor? What are you doing as a participant? Are you creating the institutions? Are you adding to the fabric? Are you adding to the mosaic or have you completely removed yourself from the process? And I, and I, and I'm worried about this and I know I'm going to get hit from some sectors of our American Muslim communities. They have lost so much faith in yeah. the political, cultural power sectors, they believe, by virtue of how you frame this, right, due to the Islamophobic, uh, the rise of Islamophobia, and we'll give examples, that no matter what we do, they'll always hate us. Yeah. So what's the point of investing? We've invested, and they still see us as an, as an outsider, which is why I think Americans, non-Muslim Americans, need so much to work with American Muslims, because the last thing you want is this generation to feel dejected, to feel marginalized, to feel cynical, to feel cynical to feel like no matter what they'll do, they'll never blend in. And that gives rise to very toxic narratives. And that's something that we have to challenge both as Americans and as Muslims, people right. working on the outside and people working on the inside. And that's why success is so important. And I'll end on this point. Nothing succeeds like success. It's not enough to have faith in the American dream. You need to hang your hat on something tangible. So, for, for example, Keith Ellison, this country can elect a Muslim congressman from Minnesota despite all the crap. Barack Hussein Obama, elected twice, uh, you know, with a middle name Hussein, born in Hawaii, raised in Indonesia with a Muslim father, can be elected twice despite all this Islamophobia, even though 17 percent of registered voters think he is a Muslim. Uh, Dia and Yusur, uh, this married couple that was tragically killed, and their uh, Yusur sister, Razan. The fact that Stephen Curry, Steph Curry from the Gold State Warriors, wrote it yeah. on his shoe says that my their pain is my pain. This is not just a Muslim pain. This is an American tragedy. This is very profound and powerful, right? And, and, I, and I think you need these symbols. Like Willow Wilson, my friend, can write Miss Marvel. And you see in Comic-Con, this, this new superhero from, for, from Marvel Comics, Asian American girls, Latino American girls, white American girls are dressing up as Miss Marvel. Do you see what I'm saying? That's yeah. whose, whose secret identity is uh, Kamala Khan. Yeah. Kamala Khan in New Jersey, Pakistani <laughs> Muslim girl with That's traditional right. Muslim parents. I mean, <laughs> and, and the fact that not only do you see right. this succeed in the mainstream, quote unquote mainstream, 
but that non-Muslim allies, both locally, nationally, and internationally, are investing in it and integrating it as part and parcel of the American narrative is huge. It's yeah. huge. Right. Right. It's you know it, it's interesting because um, back uh, you know back in 2007 I wrote my my master's thesis, and for for that thesis I I looked at the TV show Lost. Yeah. And this is actually part of my plan to not have to actually do too much reading for my thesis and just watch TV and call it research. Genius. Um, I know. Uh, it it didn't pan out that way because I ended up having to watch TV and read. So that, that plan kind of blew up in my face. But, but the premise of my thesis was look at using specifically that TV show Lost and the character Saeed. On the, you, you've seen Lost, I'm assuming, right? But, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I was using that character as a way of of examining how the portrayal of of Muslims in in narrative media, not so much um, uh, news media, but narrative media, how it's changed post 9/11. And my argument was at the time that the portrayal of Muslims has actually improved in the sense that we never had a character like Saeed. Right. Uh, on on television ever before Lost. I mean, a continuing yeah. character who who is sympathetic and everything else. And the story I told in my thesis is something that happened to both my dad and my brother uh, during separate like business trips that they went on. Both my dad and and my brother both their their first name is Sayed. So when they were getting their their rental cars. The, the, whoever you know the attendant was was like, oh Saeed, like Saeed on Lost. Oh, you know I love him on Lost. He's great. You know. Wow. And and I remember that both you know again both my dad and my brother had that same experience happen. I was like, it's amazing how something like this, a fictional character on television, people can feel a kinship with. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and, even though Sa- Saeed, technically speaking, Saeed and Sayed are their two different names, but hey, you know, you got <laughs> you got the del- details, details. Hey, Hamas, 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 Hamas. We take what we can, dude. We take what we can. Right, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. No, just, but I mean, look, just to give it a compliment. Look, uh, now that we've talked the good, let's let's marry it with the bad, and let's let's figure out what's happening. You know, right now, despite Barack Hussein Obama being elected twice. What we've also seen is more than 30 states introduce anti-Sharia legislation. Uh, you know, uh, American including law, for, Carolina. In, including North Carolina two years ago, American law for American courts written by David Yerushalmi, a notorious <laughs> Islamophobe who That's has been, right. descri- who's been described by, uh, you know, his own Jewish community as being anti-Muslim, anti-black and anti-liberal. Um, he's worked in part and parcel with the Islamophobia network that we mentioned in Fear, Inc., and, you know, the anti-Sharia legislation is about as useful as the anti-Bigfoot and anti-unicorn legislation. And I say that as an attorney. And That's so right. has American Bar Association. American Bar Association and the ACLU have said, you know, there's no Sharia threat. This is actually an anti-Muslim initiative. You see also Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham, yeah. who says that President Obama is a Muslim. He said Islam is a very wicked and evil religion. Uh, he said, you, you know, true Islam cannot be practiced in this country. And the reason why I mention him is in North Carolina, which is unfortunately suffering from a lot of this. Just a few weeks ago, you guys That's remember right. what happened? It was like two weeks. Yeah, this the story was like two weeks. Uh, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, Duke University, uh, right. you know, the, they made the decision that every Friday, uh, to accommodate their diverse religious communities, that they will allow the adhan, the call to prayer, to happen that precedes the call to prayer uh, from their 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 bell tower, and that would happen every Friday for a couple of minutes. Now it seemed that everyone was okay with it, but Franklin Graham took to his Facebook post made a rallying cry and said, look, this is proof of, uh, you know, that Christianity is under assault and you can't be a Christian anymore, but you're tolerating Islam, which is a wicked religion. And, you know, Islam, in order to be uh, properly practiced, he said in the past, you have to beat your wife and murder your children. Uh, you know, it's just very interesting to see that that also happened. And you've also seen Bobby Jindal, who yeah, should yeah. know better, you right. know, uh, parrot another Islamophobic uh, meme by Steve Emerson, another major player, and say that in America, just like in Europe, there's apparently these no-go zones in America where Muslims have taken over and implemented Sharia. And, you know, it's a colonization and an invasion. And he, of course, is doubling down because he knows it plays to his base. In Texas, you mentioned the arson that just happened a few days ago that burned yeah. down the mosque. They're still um, so, uh, they're doing uh, their investigation. But Molly White, Molly you know, White, yeah. Uh, yeah. state senator uh, Molly White, you know, it was a, an engagement day for Muslims to meet their elected officials. And she took it upon herself to say, you know, that Muslims who are, are visiting her office have to pledge allegiance to the U.S. flag. And, and with the U.S. flag, she had the Israeli flag. Yeah. And, what, and what you guys don't know is also what's happened in the last two days is that LifeWay Research, 
which is very influential uh, organization that deals with the Protestants in this country. Yeah. They did uh, a survey of their respondents, and they found out that their respondents said 25%, according to this poll, said that ISIS is true Islam. Right. So I, in American Sniper, I'll give one last one. American Sniper comes out. It's a movie yeah. which I saw, which was, you know, basically has Bradley Cooper going to Iraq, shooting people, feeling kind of sad, but not really going home, seeing his wife, going back to Iraq, shooting people, go, feeling kind of sad, but not really in going home, uh, you know, and which kind of sanitizes the real troubling legacy. And I think rhetoric of Chris Kyle uh, the sniper who apparently has the most kills of any American sniper. But, you know, look, the movie came out. And as you know, art is informed by the political reality of today and re and in turn informs the politics of society. And as you guys know, it, it, it the movie has made three hundred million dollars already. It's probably gonna make three hundred fifty, which is amazing because the movie's not yeah. that good. And yeah. it has inspired this anti-Muslim sentiment on Twitter. So for many of these people who are saying, holy crap, what's happening? I do think mainstream Islamophobic rhetoric in certain circles based off of the memes that have existed post 9-11 are increasing, but also the goodness of people is increasing and what you are seeing in a national, local and international scale is I think the struggle for what it means to be Muslim in America. And I'll go back to what I said, what it means to be American in 2015 and beyond. And that's why I think this is a profound struggle. I, Wajad, yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I, you know, I, what I wanted to do, uh, if we could, uh, is, is to take what happened, you know, in North Carolina and, and sort of unpack that. And I think many of the, almost um, maybe perhaps all the things that you've brought up, really, we, we see that play out in, in this story, um, you know, with the with the murders of Dia Barakat uh, and, 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 and Yusser and, and Razan. So, um you know, you know, I don't know, Zaki, if you have the timeline, but I mean, to me, you know, I think it would also be helpful if we sort of look at the timeline of events, right? Uh, so, so the murders happened Tuesday night uh, of last week, right. and by Wednesday morning, I mean, and you two are probably more engaged than I am. Um, the social, you know, the story is sort of going viral on social media, um, by most accounts, or or by um, most due to the fact that Muslims are sort of tweeting about it and writing about it on Facebook. Um, would you agree with that so far, Wajahat and Zaki? Well, I mean, it, it, Wajahat, if I may, before before you jump in, I, I, I've i seen a lot of criticism of of the quote-unquote mainstream media for being too well, let's slow get there. to jump on it. Or, yeah, or, I want to I wanna get there. That's what I'm trying to get at by, by uh, kind of going through the timeline. I mean, honestly, the, 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 I've I've seen that criticism that oh, where where's CNN on this and where is et cetera, and and we're talking about a period of about, uh, let's say you know twelve to sixteen hours from the time of the murder to correct the, sort of getting on mainstream. That does not seem like a a dropping the ball to me. That seems like the natural half life of, of because... starting a story and and getting it out there. Right. Yeah. And, and Wajahat, I mean, you, you are a journalist. I mean, would you yeah. agree with that assessment? Yeah. Let me tell you guys, let me try to anchor it in, in, in my response to this. I was awake Tuesday night because, you know, I have a five month old baby and uh, in my I, w I wear many hats, as you know, one of them is journalist for Al Jazeera America. And I saw this on Twitter and I saw this on my Twitter feed on Facebook, but then I had to verify it. Yeah. So then I saw the only verifications I could find at that time were local North Carolina online reports. That didn't mention the names, but mentioned this shooting and killing that happened. Now, Correct. doing more verification with one degree of Muslim separation, we found the names and the photos. So that's when I hesitantly started uh, sharing it. And the reason why I say hesitantly is because I've learned as a result of some previous tragedies, especially the Boston bombing tragedy, social media has several advantages and many disadvantages. Right. Uh, oftentimes when you just post information with a click of your thumb, you realize that the local becomes a national, becomes the international within a second. Yeah. And many misinformation and fear mongering and emotional reactions sometimes uh, actually hinder the path towards justice. I'll give you a quick example. When the Boston bombing tragedy happened, I jumped on the bandwagon that other people did and blamed the, not blame, but uh, said that, oh, look, this is South, this is, this is South Asian uh, uh, teenager. I'm forgetting his name. Pardon me. He, he might be one of the victims. Uh, he, excuse me, he might be one of the perpetrators. And, of course, we found out that it wasn't at all. It was the uh, Zarnev brothers. So as a journalist, you have to be careful. And I wanted verification. Now, quickly into the night, I was up. I get this email 
from my UC Berkeley homies who said, guys, do you know that the, that the people who were killed, Dia, is Suzanne's brother? Mm. And I'm like, oh, my God. And the, and the reason why this comes one degree of separation is Suzanne Barakat is married to my good friend from the Bay Area and a guy who went to school with, Abdul Rahman. I was at their wedding. Nice. And wow. so Suzanne, is, who is son, the son of Amina Jindali, who is one of the co-founders of ING. Sorry, I just wanted to throw that out there. No, these are titans. These are titans in yeah, the American exactly. community and wow. the Bay Area community. And, you know, Abdul Rahman is a dude who used to come over to my apartment and eat my mom's biryani. I'm at their wedding. I know these people. My wife, who's a doctor, knows Suzanne. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, now, so first Suzanne of all, you're, yeah. Yeah, at first, you're, you're, you're already shocked because it's a tragic murder. Yeah. Uh, and you realize it's Muslims. But then once you find the one degree of separation, it hits yeah. you even harder. So oh, yeah. I, I sit there and I'm like, I literally for an hour, I stare at my computer and I ask my wife, what do I say to Abdul Rahman? What do I even write? Like, I didn't even know what to write. Yeah. And uh, and I and I ended up writing something and I offered my I said, listen, I'm in the media, uh, whatever I can do for you, let me know. And my friend said, would you have to reach out to them because you're with Al Jazeera America? Now to go to and I might I might air some very unpopular opinions right now. To echo what Zaki said, I noticed that the independent and BBC world picked up on it due to the social media traffic. I also noticed that the hashtag Muslim Lives Matter and Chapel Hill shooting started trending nationally. Right. I noticed on Facebook immediately at 2 a.m. or 1 a.m. or 3 a.m. there was this emotional reaction and response. Yeah. Based on the political, cultural context that we live in, that we've already described, this existing exactly. Islamophobia, this anger, exactly. this victimization. And that sometimes, it, you, you know, I want to, for those who are listening who aren't Muslim, I want to give, an ex, I want to explain why people respond the way they do. It's not irrationality. It's not coming out of the blue. It is something that's rooted in a narrative that our communities in particular have had to deal with, right. feeling vic- victimized, feeling marginalized, you know, feeling like that there's a huge trust deficit between us and the media, us and right. politics, us and law enforcement. But at the same time, there has to be voices of, I don't want to say moderation, but voices of calm. That gives right. perspective. So that's why I took to my Facebook and I said, listen, guys, number one, take the family's lead. The family members have already put up our three winners. Let's follow their lead. Wait for a second. Number two, for those who are saying that media is not paying attention, make them pay attention. Two internationally trending hashtags started like 2 a.m. I said yeah. it's a Chapel Hill shooting and uh, Muslim Lives Matter and Independent and BBC picked it up. And number three, I said, you know, it goes back to my first point. You want to be a spectator or a participant. You have phones. You have emails. Go to your local media. Go to your national media. Tell them about it. And number four, before we know anything, there's an ongoing investigation. Only publish facts. Wait on everything else. And if you want to really do something positive, explain to America why these people were so beloved. Tell America why, they were, why there's an outpouring support. Share your pain. You know, make America care. Make America fall in love with them, just like Muslim communities fell in love with them. And yeah. then, you know, I woke up. I'm walking to work around like 9 a.m. I get a phone call from Lori Goodstein, uh, Goodstein from New York Times, who calls me out of the blue and says, "This, you know, we're doing a piece in the next hour. I just assumed you're Muslim. Do you know anything about it? And I said, listen, I know the family. She goes, oh, my God. Huh. And so, Al yeah. Jazeera, you know, Al Jazeera picks it up. Al Jazeera English picks it up. So, look, the media was on top of it. That's right. And the media did cover it, and the media is still covering it. And and I know it seems like it isn't, but that's what's happening. Now, I want to add a point which might be controversial, and I might be a minority voice here. Uh, I know that you're talking about the timeline. Around 3 p.m., 2 p.m. of Wednesday, and, of course, the shooting happened on Tuesday, mm-hmm. you saw almost a unanimous outcry for American Muslims to say that this was a hate crime. Huh. While the investigation was ongoing, exactly. um, I was an individual who said it very well could be a hate crime, but that should not be the focus right now. Let the investigation right. play out. Now, this is my concern, and I might, again, get a lot of heat for this. It is very hard to prove a hate crime. Thank you. If huh. most – I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say this. Most likely, if law enforcement and the FBI and whoever else is investigating this comes back and says it isn't a hate crime, Number one, what impact will it have in our communities? And we can dissect this. And number two, does it in any way reduce the value of their lives? Does it in any way reduce the tragedy that happened? Does it in any, any way uh, mitigate or lessen the need to headline this? 
And if it does, that goes to show you the troubling aspects of our society, that something has to be posited around such vile emotions for it to gain traction. But number two, for American yeah. Muslim communities to put all your eggs in a hate crime basket, for lack of a better analogy, uh, if they come back, and no one's talking about this, if law right. enforcement comes back and says it's not a hate crime, are we psychologically, emotionally, culturally prepared to respond? And my fear is that there's so much anger that people it will again people will say look it's a conspiracy look law mm-hmm. enforcement is against us look politicians right. are against us and See, their lives don't matter and i think that's I, something our leaders really need to talk about what happens if it comes back and there's it's not a hate crime i agree no i think it's a very very important point which i had then i mean and again you know I, I was sort of slow slowly building up to sort of again going through the timeline because i think you know you pointed to you know first like grievance number one that we saw that that I saw was okay. Where's the media? Grievance number two was why isn't the FBI involved? Why isn't this being pursued as a hate crime? And I was like, again, let's exercise caution on both on, on both the media issue as well as the hate crime issue. For many of the same, you know, and with regards to the latter, for many of the same points that you've articulated. And again, you know, as a lawyer like yourself, I mean, you know, hate crime legislation is or proving a crime to be a very proving difficult. it to be a hate crime is very difficult. It's a very difficult threshold. You're better off trying to prove a first degree murder in the case, in, in, in the state of North Carolina, which is which which is a death penalty case. So at the end of the day, it's sort of a wash, other than the optics of it, other than getting the quote unquote hate crime asterisk, if you will, you know, in terms of the murder. Uh, so I, I I agree with you uh, with, with regards to that. And again, I think going back to the same issue of well, where's the you know where where's the federal authorities, where is the president, and so on. I was like, look, man, just give it some time. We're not even 24 hours outside, you know, I, I mean, I, you know uh, after the murders and, uh, you know, let the local authorities investigate it. And, and, you know, people were jumping all over the place because the police had said that it was over a parking dispute. Um, again, it's an ongoing investigation. It doesn't mean that the police have now, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, hanged everything on that on, on that on that particular uh, issue. So, you know, uh, two things I just want to add. It's yeah. good. It's good that for those people listening to this, they're putting the pressure on. Because, I agree. You know, everyone has roles. Let me put it this way. Everyone has roles uh, to play. Okay, you want to exert outside pressure, inside pressure, push and pull. Uh, and also the reason for the frustration, again, for your listeners, is because just like so many other minority communities, and I'm not trying to co-opt anyone's suffering, there is this trust deficit. There is this feeling of, you know, law enforcement doesn't care. There is this feeling of media doesn't care. And it goes back to the point because we don't have players in these fields yeah. who are advancing our agenda. And oftentimes we feel as spectators, not participants. We feel as footnotes, not protagonists. Right. And there's that palpable fear, that palpable paranoia, that palpable uh, feeling of co- even conspiracy theories. Let's be honest. Right. Let's be like, real. It, it's all part yeah, of that. It's not rooted in, in madness. It's not rooted in uh, fiction. There's very real reasons why this has happened systemically, why people behave this way. But I am going to say something also that is going to be somewhat controversial. I, am, I believe that several folks in our communities use these tragedies with the best of sincere intentions to hijack it, to promote their own narratives and agendas. If you guys agree with me or disagree with me, let me know. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I, I think that, that's apt. I, I, I do think, however, that there to, to, and, and like you said, I think it's important to, to, to really foreground the idea that even with the best of intentions, because because, you know, there, there certainly yeah. may be people who are self-serving. But I think I think on balance, most people who do get upset over these things are coming from a place of genuine concern. What agree, agree, agree. Um, agree. Uh, you know, the, the, there's, you know, just some of the stuff you've you've listed, right? We've got Molly White. We've got, uh, obviously, uh, uh, what happened in, in Raleigh, Durham. We've got, or excuse me, in Chapel Hill. Um, you know, uh, uh, the, the the Houston Islamic Center, et cetera, et cetera. So, so for many people, they start seeing uh, these incidents, which may in fact be not not related, but they they find a correlation. Yeah, of course. How can you not? Right. You see, you see a rising trend. And look, I, I want to grant it because I'm, I'm probably going to get hit for the comments that I made. But again, no. look, Wajad, I, I, I think, yeah, I, I want to grant it. Look, no, no, no. People, people are not. Uh, these are not illegitimate concerns. Right. Uh, this is grounded in a systemic 
reality of, you know, quite literally this Islamophobic sentiment and anti-Muslim sentiment that that has some very tangible truth. And we're living in very scary times right now, both locally, nationally, internationally. So people are nuts. People aren't insane. People aren't... uh, hysterical there's a re- and even if they are there's a reason, there's a reason for this it. type of national re- but that being said that being said does that excuse sometimes irresponsible actions no right so you can explain it and rationalize it but that means that we have to emerge as the best versions of ourselves that's right. and certain certain actors who have the ability to do so have to exercise caution and if necessary get hit in the short run yeah. To say this stuff that will help our communities in the long run. Now, right. I also know I want to respect the family because I know Suzanne and the family right now, as of right now, are very uh, proactive and very uh, transparent and, and, and vocal about being this being treated as a hate crime. And I know that they have their justifications for it. So I'm fine with that. I understand. All I'm saying is our community has to be prepared for what's sure. going to happen when right. most likely – they come back and say it's not a hate crime. And I don't think we are prepared to have that type of sophisticated response and understanding right now. Right. Emotionally even, yeah, to, to, to sort of deal with that. And I think, you know, I think one of the points that has been brought up again and again that there are legitimate reasons for the Muslim community to feel the way it does. But I think, again, that what I would caution um, – uh, you know, uh, the, the Muslim community or, or us as, as members of the Muslim community is that there's a difference between, you know, feeling uh, or justifying, you know, just, sorry, justifiably seeing ourselves as part of uh, this sort of victimization that takes place. But at, on, on the one hand, on the other hand, to sort of adopt a kind of victim mentality or to be or to view ourselves as a community under siege. And I think a lot of time, a lot of what we're seeing uh, in terms of the early responses or that or that uh, uh, the tendency to have these kind of responses early on is that kind of siege mentality of course yep uh, and i think it's i think it 's poisonous for us in the long run I it is it 's toxic i agree it is it is it is toxic and so i don't i, I don 't want i don 't want to teach my child that uh, the American Muslim narrative is that I suffer well. Well, it, you know, you know what, Jonathan, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you, you, you bring up uh, your kid and you, you just became a parent recently. And and obviously, uh, Pervez and I have both been parents for a while. And I, I'm, I'm always reminded of something that John Stewart uh, said in an interview. I, I want to say it was with Bill Moyers. I might be wrong about that. But it's something that always stuck with me. And, and I, I heard this like even before I became a bit, uh, parent where he was talking about his own worldview and how it changed. And he talked about how, you know, when you become a parent, uh, your world gets bigger and smaller at the same right, time. Right, right, right. And, and I think a big part of becoming smaller is that your circle of concern shrinks. To the oh, extent that, you know, the idea that, you know, and, and certainly for me, like, m- my life revolves around my kids to the extent that I'm, I'm, my job is to keep them safe and to try to make a world that will be safe for them. And, and you're like, and, and you're, you have like 800 kids. That people don't know. <laughs> that is an exact number, by the way. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Zucky, Zucky has literally his own cricket team of boys. <laughs> That's not an exaggeration. <laughs> he does. He I does. mean, it's you know, and and I think a, a lot of sort of and and you know, some of the responses I've seen from people uh, put very eloquently, and and they're coming from a place of of almost almost despair. I don't want to use the phrase despair, but uh, of of. Uh, uh, great, great sadness uh, is this sense of, you know, we, we've we're now and we've seen it happen really, where the the, um, the American Muslim community in this country is shifting now to the primary actors being second generation. So people right. like yourself and it's you know so we don't think of ourselves as, as other. Like- Right. You know, we don't I, like certainly for me, and I'm, I, I say this with with sincerity. I've I've personally never encountered Islamophobia mm. that I know of. You know, that I know of. I mean, I mean, maybe I have. I didn't get a job or something that I wanted. You know, but I've I don't have my otherness sort of rubbed in my face constantly. You know, I don't think right. of myself as being anything yeah. but an American. And so I think what a lot of people who, who look at, for example, pictures of Dia and, and, and uh, Usor, and, and, you know, they, they hear the things that uh, she said in, in an interview just, just uh, a month or so ago, yeah. and, and Dia, who, who is a, a fan of, of Steph Curry. And, you know, we, we see an example of successful, not even assimilation and integration, but of just yeah. being 
a, a Muslim in America. You in know, America, right? right. This, and, this fully, fully. Uh, 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 I don't even want to say Americanized, but just you know, it's 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 not something where there is this conflict, right? So, so for so, a lot, I, I know for me, like I look at the pictures of them at their wedding, and I'm like, my God, that was me. Yeah, years ago. that's exactly. I mean, I remember when I first heard about the murders. I mean, I, you know, I was just thinking back to, you know, I, I was a young 22 year old, you know, new, new, newly married. Uh, Usher and I were living in an apartment complex. I mean, that could have been us, you know, yeah, that could have been us right. and, and my disgruntled neighbor, you know. So and, and you know, we were living in, in, in Texas. So like, it, you know, yeah, it was it, it, it hit home. And I, and I think and I, and I appreciate you kind of taking the conversation there, Zaki, because that's kind of where I wanted to go, which is. You know, obviously, I mean, the, none of what we say now or what I'm going to say or I'm about to say is within the tragedy of it. But in terms of what has happened now, in terms mm. of, you know, th- these three young, bright stars losing their lives, um, you know, in terms of like a media story, it, 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 in terms of, you know, again, as a Muslim, you know, and, and, and the way the story is getting played out in the media, you almost couldn't ask and again, I, I please pardon me if this comes out wrong, but you couldn't ask for a better story yeah. in a sense that here are these three very attractive, very successful. Uh, and again, opt, you know, optics are important. They look they look Caucasian. Right. Let's be real about that or, or identify that part of the, of the of the of the of the story as well. And they were gunned down, you know, or, or killed completely unjustifiably uh, by this. Literally, the man's name is Hicks. Like he, you know, so they're killed by this like like backwater hillbilly. Uh, and so, you know, I want you, Wajahat, if you could, you know, again from your point vantage point of being a journalist, to kind of talk about that as a story and how what we as a Muslim community can do. Because again, as a journalist, you know, these things, these stories, no matter how big or small they are, they have a very short shelf life vis-a-vis yeah. the media. Yeah. And, and and actually, well, John, before before you you jump in, I just I, I think it's it's worth pointing out that that you know notwithstanding how Pervez was characterizing him, I mean this guy was not a hillbilly. I mean he was. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. You know, I mean, I mean he you know, and and I think that that's that's an important thing to point out because it shows how somebody who you know, I mean he depending on. What, what you see on his Facebook page, he was uh, uh, no, we, a, a liberal conservative or a conservative progressive. No, I, was, I, I would characterize him as the far left. I mean, right? I mean, sure. to me, like, we talk about the far right. I mean, this guy represented pure far leftist sort of positions. Ka- ka- kind of the, the Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins. Uh, yeah, certainly, alleged, his views alleged, on abortion. Well, allegedly, right. No, I mean, allege- allegedly not a Fox viewer, like a liberal and anti Yes, yes, that's what I mean. Far, like, let's say, quote unquote, far left. So, you know, we often characterize, you know, the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, kind of backlash that we feel as a Muslim community coming from the far right. But this would seem to, you know, fly in the face of that. I mean, I think it's it, it just, uh, it's tragic and sad that uh, we can't see victims as, vic- as victims. We have to compartmentalize them and think immediately for PR strategy as well. And that's a reflection of being a marginalized community. And I didn't mean to, no, I, I, no, I, no, that's but, what I was trying to very carefully. No, no, no but you were, you're trying to be very sensitive to a very real re- reality that unfortunately we have to deal with, right? Because the first thing you think of, let's be honest, uh, if it's Muslims doing the deeds, what's the minority Muslim prayer? Please God, let it be a white don't guy. Don't let it be a Muslim. Right. Be white guy. Don't let it be a Muslim. <laughs> That's so, right. So, or, or please let it be a European Muslim. And now it doesn't yeah. even matter if it's a European Muslim. No, it doesn't. People like Rupert Murdoch and everyone saying moderate Muslims yeah. are to be blamed and everyone should be condemned. So yeah. there is automatically a Nirjik reaction because you know that local tragedies impact the international narrative and conversations that the world is having about Muslims and Islam. And that means you and that means your communities and that potentially means your families. Yeah, right. That's the reality that we live in. That's so, right. That being said, um, as far as a story goes, um, this story is tragic for multiple reasons. The manner in which they were killed, the potential aspects of a hate crime, the fact that it's North Carolina, and also the fact that these kids, I mean, I'm old enough, I call them kids. They weren't just normal kids. They were exceptional kids. Yeah. I mean, look at how much they accomplished uh, in their lives. I mean, they selfless activism, 
uh, local level, national level, international level. You know, Yusuf was like 21 and she had already gone to Turkey to help Syrian uh, refugee children. And her new husband was going to follow her lead and set up a nonprofit that now, mashallah, has $350,000 um, due to crowd, crowdfunding, right? Uh, they were loved. Uh, they were active. They were smart. They were Southerners. They were, uh, you know, they mm-hmm. loved basketball. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were bright. Their families are bright. They're hyper educated. They're good looking. They're just good people. And so it's sad reflection of our society that it takes usually a tragedy for us to wake up to a reality, both good and bad, that exists under our very own noses and for us Mm -hmm. to acknowledge it. And Mm -hmm. it's sad to see that it takes a tragedy for us to humanize Muslims who are already human beings. That's right. Uh, Thank you. You know, my job is not to humanize anyone. I'm already a human. My (laughs) job is just to share a story and for you to eventually realize we're people too. That being said, the onus, unfortunately, see, people might disagree with me. Some people say the onus is not on me. It's on them to, like, you know, to cure their Islamophobia. Maybe. Maybe. But what also, if you follow the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, despite all the, despite all the the discrimination and, and he faced and the abuse, he never missed an opportunity to to clear the air and to uh, talk to someone, right? And, 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 and alleviate their concerns, yeah. right? Because he was about he, creating psychological space. And, and he knew, right? Like he could have easily said, listen, it's not my fault that you're a hateful bigot yeah. that's trying to assassinate right. me and kill my people. That's right. uh, but any opportunity, that, you know, because he didn't have a position of power at that time. He didn't have a position of strength. He knew that people were ignorant. And I think also there was a reflection that most people don't possess a malignant heart. They're not oh, malicious. They're mm-hmm. not born with anti-Muslim hate. What I have mm-hmm. seen, and in the research shows this, is that most people, twofold when it comes to Islamophobia, they don't know a Muslim. They just don't know. And what they do know is inf- unfortunately informed by these sensationalistic headlines. Right. So in this tragedy, you have, and I hate saying this, an opportunity. How do you want to use it? Do you want to bridge the divides? Do you want to share the amazing real story of these three children with America to show them a face of an American Islam that is authentic, that's sincere, that is shared by so many American Muslims? Do you want to heal the waters? Do you want to bridge the divides? Do you want to uh, reach out your hands and tell people, listen, we exist, we have existed, let's work together in solidarity? Or do you want to retreat? And I think it is an opportunity to do the former, and I know it's not fair, and I know it sucks, and I know it's not our duty to do it, and I know it sucks to be an outsider, I know there's hicks, and there's <laughs> haters, and there's Islamophobia, but you know what? It's, it's, we're in a position right now where we don't have the institutional strength, the media power, the political power, the cultural power, and yes, tag, you're it, you're the American boogeyman, yeah. other people have done it before us, Jews have gone through this, Catholics have gone through this, what are you going to do? Are you going to be a spectator or are you going to be a participant? And right. how do you choose to participate? And I think it's one of those situations where out of a tragedy, sometimes maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there can be some good because there's so much ugliness in this tragedy. Is there any good? Is it the hidden hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing us that there's a merciful road out, a path forward? And I think these three kids, by virtue of how they lived their lives, by virtue of who they were, are these bright shining stars for us to illuminate a path forward. Right. Uh, you know, and Wajad, I, I think we'd be remiss not to say, and you, you know, you've, you've obviously mentioned Suzanne, but I feel that the family, the way that the direct family has responded with regards to, you know, uh, being on the media, you know, obviously Suzanne has done some amazing uh, interviews with Anderson Cooper being the highlight right. of a highlight of that. You know, I mean, to come from a culture, as most Muslims do, where it is uh, generally considered commendable or part of our cultural milieu that we grieve on our own. We grieve in private, right? I mean, public grieving isn't really part of the Muslim cultural experience. But for the family to put that aside and to, and to be out, you know, make themselves available, uh, both of the fathers, right? Uh, you know, Mr. Baraka, Dr. Uh, Abu Salha were out, you know, they, they did interviews. I think that's, that says a lot about the family. I don't know if you've had direct conversations with Suzanne or her husband. But... Yeah, yeah. I mean, an hour before Suzanne uh-huh. gave her press conference, this was about f- uh, f- 
4 p.m. was her press conference on Wednesday. Uh, because I know the family, and they reached out to a few of us, and they said, you know, just to talk and guidelines. But it was, you know, it was 3 p.m. We were waiting for a few people to get on the phone call, and, you know, Abdul Rahman was there, and then we were yeah. waiting for Susanna, we were waiting for someone else, and then it was just quiet for three minutes because what do you say? Huh. And I remember... I, I said the only thing I said. I think I might have broken the ice. Uh, I said, uh, first and foremost, there's nothing that I can say. I, uh, any words that I say right now will in no way, shape, or form uh, repair the, the, you know, the pain and, and the loss. But all I can say is do dua that these three bright stars that were lost, inshallah, the, Allah subhanahu wa taala embraces them with the the, the warmest of embrace uh, in jannah. And anything that we can do as a community to help unburden your pain. Let us know we're at your service, and and you would expect, you know, them to be crying or hysterical, but they were so mashallah poised and strong and calm, the and, courage and, 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 yeah. and courageous, and and you know both of them, Abdul Rahman and, yeah. and and Suzanne. This was an hour before a press conference. Then you see her at the press conference, and you saw how she, her and the entire family did it, and then you saw her on Anderson right. the, later that night, and I think you know a part of her what she said was, I'm perhaps. I'm able to do this because I'm still in shock. I'm and numb. I able yeah. To, yeah, I'm numb. Yeah. I'm numb. And, yeah. and, and a lot of people who've talked to them have said this. And But at the same time, I think also, the, I'm not speaking for the family. I'm just saying now as an observer, the family itself is, mashallah, so polished, so strong, and so dignified, and also right. so aware, hyper aware yeah. of how this impacts local, national, international conversations and communities I think that's why they've taken upon themselves, and even though it's not their burden, and even though no one's expecting them to do this, we just want them to mourn. Like literally, we, we just said, want them to mourn, right? Just right. mourn. As, you know, we said to them, we said we have so many other messengers that can carry your water. We have so mm. many other people who can help you. Like if you just unload on us, you guys mourn. But I think they realized this is an opportunity. Like you mentioned, it's a small media cycle. They don't want their 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 family members to die in vain. They don't want their family members to be forgotten. They don't want their family members just to be executed by this this individual named Hicks, and then people just move on. They want it to mean something. And I think yeah. for them, what they wanted to mean, uh, what I can see from what they've done is two things. They wanted to share the story, and I think Suzanne did a beautiful job and an important job to share the story of yes. who these people were on Anderson Cooper. And I'll tell you the effect that had on my newsroom. Fifth floor of my newsroom, it was all these non-Muslims, and they're like, they were crying, retelling uh, wow. watching Anderson Cooper because they said what she did was exactly right and powerful is that she made me know these people. She right. made me care about these people. Like I did not know, but then hearing her and the nicknames and the, and the relationship and the, the charity yeah. and the basket, you know, just these things that illuminate you, you stop becoming a statistic and a headline. You become a person. And that's what we lost. We lost three people. We lost three that's lives. Right. And we lost three lives that touched hundreds of people. And I think the fact that Suzanne was able to do that was powerful. And secondly, what they're doing now, I think the reason why they're saying is treat this seriously as a hate crime is I think they don't want this replicated. They don't want this to be another another tragedy, another sensationalism. And they want to, I think, and again, I'm just, I don't know, but I'm just saying, I think it's treat this seriously because we don't want any other family to to suffer like we've suffered. And we want to change the discourse to make sure that anti-Muslim bigotry and fear are reduced so that this becomes an isolated incident. So Correct. for family right. to carry all that weight on their shoulder and not yeah. break is, is absolutely remarkable. That's right. And, and I think it also, you know, we, we've talked about the media response. We've talked about, obviously, the president comes forth and issues a statement, you know, uh, late last week. But I think the outpouring of support, you know, I mean, just today I heard – I think Chick-fil-A did something. I mean, just the outpouring of support. We've talked about Steve Curry, right. you know, the fact that he's going to he's gonna write uh, a tribute to Dia on his shoes today. Sorry, yeah, uh, yeah. Today. yeah, today no, is the yeah. All-Star game. He, he did it already uh, at the, the three-point three competition. Oh, that's right. right. That's right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I saw the tweet, right. Uh, so, I mean, the outpouring of support from, I think, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, larger community, the larger, uh, you know, the, the larger American community has been really overwhelming. Well, and, and, positive, positive. 
And I mean, Wajahat, I mean, uh, we, we spent a lot of time sort of on the micro in terms of dis- dissecting this this tragedy and responses to that. But I, I really wanted to pivot uh, for a little bit yeah. and talk about the work that you're doing uh, beyond, you know, obviously being front and center at, at Al Jazeera. But, you know, obviously it's it, to anybody who knows you, you, you know, you you were out front in terms of putting the American Muslim narrative out there with, with domestic crusaders, which was shortly after 9-11. And, and you've got some projects that you're that you're working on right now i would love for you to unpack some of those specifically mj which is the the project that you've been working on with dave eggers yeah i mean look uh thank you for that uh, i I, been, I look i just tell stories right like i don't try to tell muslim stories i grew up as a kid in the bay area i went to an all boys jesuit catholic high school bellarmine where i was like the token muslim uh, and we did improv comedy and with our troupe and i wasn't the muslim improv comedian. I wasn't the Pakistani one. I just happened to be a dude who happened to be Muslim and Pakistani. At UC Berkeley, uh, and where I was part of the MSA board uh, in 2001 for 9-11, you know, we started the first uh, sketch comedy troupe called the Guad Squad. And again, most of the stuff that I did was not just Muslim and Pakistani, but once they realized I was able to share that, they, they said, oh, we'll use that as part of our arsenal also. Huh. And so the reason why I mentioned that is I've always just tried to tell stories because I enjoy telling stories, and I happen to be Muslim and Pakistani, right? I'm not interested in being an apologist or a propagandist. Uh, with Domestic Crusaders, it's a play that I wrote. I started for my 21st birthday in 2001, and I finished it for my 23rd birthday in 2003. It was my African-American professor, Ishmael Reed, who encouraged me to start writing it. And he said at that time that things are going to get really bad for American Muslims for a while. You're going to get hazed, he said. He says, as an African-American, I've been through it. But he said the way to fight back is through art and culture and storytelling you know, to put your voice in the narrative, because we don't have access to politics and finance sometimes, but we can tell good stories. And what I've always tried to do is tell universal stories through a culturally specific lens. My (laughs) audience has always, always, always been a diverse global audience, diverse and global because I am a new media generation type guy. I tweet, I Facebook, I poke, I I LinkedIn, I Skype, right? I always knew that I had access to the globe that way. So the play is I think has the DNAs of what I've always tried to do. The play was about uh, an American Muslim family of six Pakistani Americans, three generations, you know, old school kitchen drama, if you really think about it, but told through a fresh lens, uh, if you will, of American Pakistani Muslims. Um, MJ is a continuation of that almost because I was in the Bay Area. And when I lived in the Bay Area, I, I struck up a friendship with author Dave Eggers of McSweeney's fame, who also wrote Zaytun and Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius. And, you know, we work together really well. And one day out of the blue, he calls me up and he says, listen, uh, let's write a TV show. I read this story about like Muslim American cops and that the NYPD is like trying to recruit Muslim American cops. Like if you can come up with an idea, uh, we could pitch it to HBO because they've been on my butt to pitch them ideas. So I'm like, all right. So I wrote like at 2 a.m. the sketch notes of this profile of this guy called MJ, who is the nickname of Mujaddid al-Ghazali, who is a Yemeni-American <laughs> cop from the Bay Area, who grew up in Yemen, in the mean streets of Yemen, saw the Civil War, his family moved here to the Bay Area, his father, like many Yemeni Americans in the Bay Area, not all, made his money in the liquor stores and convenience stores. Mm. Um, He has an old school traditional family, but after he grew up inhaling 80s pop culture, like all of us. And he, after 9-11, he decided to become a cop, but he was the one person in his family who got the degree, the scholarship to go study engineering at UC Berkeley. So the family always thinks that this is the guy who's going to be the, the, the nerd who's going to actually get us out of the liquor stores and convenience stores. And instead, he becomes a detective, and he makes a detective earliest in his SFPD precinct, which is filled with, like, all these old school, as we say, kind of inbred Catholic hicks. Uh, you know, he's, like, he, who are good guys, but, like, there's, like, this yeah. old school Irish Catholic type mindset, and he's, like, one of the few minorities, the only Muslim. Right. And we thought, wouldn't it be cool to tell a story through the cop show – but make the uh, protagonist an American Muslim and also reveal the multicultural diversity of the Bay Area, which is, if you will, a microcosm of the diversity of America and the globe. We'll sure. anchor it We'll anchor it with a cool detective story, but it'll also give us an excuse to really kind of talk, uh, in, uh, dissect the idiosyncrasies uh, of the Bay Area and America and identity and being an outsider and an insider. And, you know, the father has a liquor store. The mom wants him to divest from the liquor store because they're religious. Uh, MJ's best friend is a white convert imam named Brooks, who's the imam of the local masjid. His sister, his sister has a crush on Brooks. Brooks has a crush on the sister, but the parents don't know. 
uh, his brother is married to a, an Afghan woman living in Fremont. And I thought, you know, wouldn't this be cool to, to kind of unpack all of this? And so we wrote the pilot for HBO. HBO gave us, uh, uh, you know, gave us three, three contracts, I mean, three drafts. After the second draft, we realized they wanted something like Homeland meets Bill Cosby show. And, and, and we wrote this two years ago around the zeitgeist of uh, Homeland and Walking Dead, like genre television. Sure. And, oh. and Hollywood is all about formula. So at that time, they were like, you know, they were great. I really loved working with HBO. I understand why so many creatives go to HBO because they're very creative anchored. They're like, they work with you for your vision, right? And I loved working with them. But ours was so odd. There, there was no formula. Like it wasn't yeah. Homeland versus uh, Cosby Show. It, it was, it was very unique, and we made it very unique and idiosyncratic to make it so different from Twenty Four and Homeland because we thought that the narrative of American Muslims is often good Muslim, bad Muslim. Good Muslim is that Muslim who helps law enforcement. Bad Muslim are these Muslim orcs he has to kill. Right. Um, and we wanted, and we wanted, and we didn't want to make like Twenty Five. Starring like the brown keeper, right? <laughs> so, so literally, we did something totally 25 different. Twenty-five because we'd also be late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd be like, yeah, we show up late. It'd, it'd be twenty-seven. <laughs> yes, <Yeah, sorry. laughs> No, it'd, it'd be twenty-seven. We thought you said twenty-six. <laughs> and, uh, and and basically the brown, yeah, and the brown cop would like basically end up shooting himself in the foot. And then and then and then you know that's probably what would happen. But, but the long story short, yeah. we realized we were two steps ahead. And we got rights back. Huh. And because Dave has a crazy life, I have a crazy life. We just delayed it. We finally tidied it up. And we released the first half of MJ on McSweeney's with the intention of any person who's a filmmaker or studio, you want to take a crack at it? Take a crack at it. We kind of crowdsourced it. It came out last huh. week. And then NPR did a big piece on it just yesterday. And I had no idea it would get so much traction. And oh. slowly but surely, people are like, oh, this is really good. And we always knew people would let, dig it. So anyone who's read it, they're like, this is really good. Now we're just waiting to see if anyone's going to invest in it. And let's see. Like, uh, the last point I say is Hollywood, like any, any industry, runs on the color green. That's the only color that matters. And for all of the Muslims listening who say, oh, it's against us, if you can pitch a story – about Muslim unicorns eating hummus and biryani, and somehow, and somehow, niche amongst niche people like dorks like Zucky, all of a sudden, are like, yes, we were waiting for Muslim unicorns eating biryani. And I have and become, been for a long time. So. <laughs> and right. it becomes like the next serial or Miss Marvel. Hollywood would invest in it. So mm -hmm. we're at that point right now where we're seeing Bismillah and unveiling it. And if it doesn't get made, that's fine. At the very least, if it gets people to think differently and if it puts the waswasa, the whisper in people's heads and say, oh, wait a second, maybe America might be ready for this type of a show, then I have done my job. Huh. Now, waswasa is usually satanic. So let's let you – this is the angelic whisper. Angelic waswasa. <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the waswasa that uh, tells you to do fudger prayer. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Well, you know, you know, it it tells you something that when we were kids, uh, the the probably one of the most prominent Muslim characters was Kamal Khan in Octopussy, and, and now it's and, Kamal uh, Khan. Lady, lady, uh, children, go Google Octopussy. Yeah. It will not That's get true. you in trouble with your parents. <laughs> you don't have to go on YouPorn to watch it. You can actually put it in. It is a James but, Bond movie. But, by the way, uh, uh, while, while we were talking, uh, news uh, came out that Louis Jordan, who played uh, Kamal Khan, just passed away. So. Oh, I'm sorry, Louis Jordan. Yeah, but sorry, but so, so we've gone from Kamal Khan to Kamala Khan. Kamala so, Khan, yeah. So yeah. that, that wow. says something. You know, I, I will say, uh, Wajat, I don't know if you remember this, but you and I, we went to see Zero Dark Thirty, which um, – I have to say, I think I think overall, uh, in terms of portrayal of of the the Muslim world, uh, was overall better than than, for example, American Sniper. Yeah, agreed. Um, I, I don't know if you remember, but there's the character in that film who is, you know, the the CIA head, or, or one of the heads of the CIA, and it turns out he's Muslim. Right. That's, actually based, that's apparently based on a real person, by the way. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I just remember that being a very effective example of sort of pattern interruption. Um, yeah, and, 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 and shocking people's expectations, I mean, in a positive way, in the sense that, like, oh, hey, look, you know, anybody can be Muslim. Oh, can, look, can, I, can, can, can I make a comment about pattern interruption? I think the reason why we haven't advanced is because, look, it, it is something like Homeland. Even Homeland tries for diversity, right? It tries for nuance. It tries to inject that one good Muslim, and it tried to make Brody 
a guy who prayed namaz and loved his family but was so conflicted. But the problem again is, and this is why I think we haven't advanced it, is the narrative anchor is rooted um, in a national security context, right? Oh, yeah. So instead of the instead of the ball being pushed forward or us going vertical, it goes horizontal. It's anchored in stasis. Does that make sense? So it's, like, so it's almost like, yes, I'm the good Muslim and I'm, a, I'm more nuanced and I have more warts and messiness and I'm more real. But, oh, look, I'm still the minority good Muslim in an ocean of orcs anchored yeah. around a national security framework. Instead of us pushing the ball forward and say, yeah, I'm a girl from Jersey who's Pakistani and I now awesome. stretch because I have superpowers. Or, <laughs> or right. I'm, I'm the dude who's the goofy next door neighbor uh, who smells like biryani and comes two, three minutes late but I'm part of your friend's crew. Like yeah. that's pushing the ball forward. Yeah. But you know, it reminds me it it what you're saying really illustrates how how you know, you talk about how we haven't moved the ball forward. I mean, 1998 uh, the siege uh, the you know, um yeah. uh, starring uh, Denzel Washington and it's about terrorism, etc. and you have uh, Tony Shaloub playing uh, right. Farouk Haddad, you know, but he, he's yeah. like the good the good guy Muslim. And we know he's a good guy cuz he's actually frank and he drinks and he cheats on his wife and um, he's a good Muslim. He's a normal Muslim. He's a, exactly. He's a, he cheats on his wife and he drinks. Anyone who drinks is a safe Muslim. He's safe. That's right. That's right. I mean, well, you know, if if anything, I, this conversation illustrates just sort of the depth and breadth of of you know uh, how, the the Muslim narrative and certainly the the role that you've been playing both in in these both of these hats you're wearing as a journalist and as a uh, as a playwright and an author. You know, so so obviously we're we're ecstatic to have been able to spend this much time with you and just sort of, yeah, absolutely. you know, and it's been, you know, to, to speak about the American Muslim narrative, Zaki, I think we, you know, I consider myself very fortunate. I mean, you know, to, to be able to co-host this show with you. I mean, we've been, you know, we, we've had folks like Asif Mandvi, you know, his project halal and the family, I think is going places. Uh, you know, speaking of like, you know, in terms of screenwriters, we've had screenplay writers, we've had, you know, um, Kamran Pasha on, we've right. had, yeah. you know, Farhan Tahir in terms of being in front of the camera, in front of the screen. Uh, you know, Wajahat, I've often joked with Zaki, you know, we, you know, you guys talked about pe- pattern disruption. But one of the ongoing patterns that we've had, at least on the show, is sort of reformed attorneys, like lawyers, yeah. <laughs> lawyers who are no longer practicing or are doing everything they can but practice law. Yeah. So uh, you follow at the, on the footsteps of Azhar Usman, right? Right. Who's, who's also a trained uh, attorney like yourself and uh, but, but uh, you know, makes his money by doing stand-up comedy. And uh, uh, so Kamran's and, and also I mentioned Kamran Pasha, another attorney. And, and Dean, 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 Dean Obedullah, also yeah. comedian but uh, trained lawyer. I still have. I, by the way, I still am a licensed attorney. I, I was going to say, if card. people want to contract you for uh, for some work, you're still licensed in California, and, and right? This is, this is proof that I'm son of immigrants and paranoid. <laughs> like any second, all this can go away, and I will hang my hat on that attorney card, and I will do your H1 visas. See, if 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 I had known that I could go to law school and n- do other stuff and not be a lawyer, I probably would have gone to law school. So, uh, but yeah, but no one tells you the debt that we have. So, <laughs> you know, but speaking of lawyers, or, or I should say, like, sort of tangentially related, you know, what's ironic is that we've actually never had a medical doctor on. Screw uh, them. Uh, Screw them. <laughs> well, I was just about to say, your wife is a doctor. Not, not only is your wife, is, is she a physician? I mean, she's involved in some amazing work. I mean, so put in a good word for us, and maybe we the can get... The tyranny of doctors must end. <laughs> Time is coming. They're they're the humans and we're the apes, all right. So it's the rise rise of the planet of the apes. See now you're speaking my lingo, man. There you go. <laughs> no, I, I love my wife. I have to say that because she's listening to me. And as we all know, uh, if you don't say you love your wife, happy wife, happy life, happy wife, happy life. I That's right. Uh, here we are, you know, the day after Valentine's Day. But I mean that sincerely. I mean it'd be great to have uh, you know your wife on on the show or someone you know who. She's who, awesome. No, you should actually should talk to my wife. My uh, yeah. yeah. Speaking about marrying up, mashallah, my wife is like a superstar baller because that's what I'm. Yeah. Not only is a family practitioner and teaches at Georgetown, but she's a a human rights and a, a human rights and a scholar dealing with uh, victims of trauma. And alhamdulillah, right. she's traveled uh, around the world dealing with these people. She's a global health scholar, also, exactly. and she's also an athlete who was an NCAA athlete and a runner. And she actually represented America in Iran's Muslim Olympics. And on top of that, she does uh, inner city work with Project Reach, 
to help uh, marginalized uh, Muslim American communities and young women in D.C. and Virginia. And the funny thing about her is she's a Southerner. So she can also give you this example of growing up in the South. Yeah. And just and just to give proof how I married a Southerner and how they're so weird, like strange creatures. <laughs> Like yesterday, yeah, 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 I'm from Texas, so slow it down. You guys, you guys are weird, man. Yesterday it was freezing, <laughs> 11 p.m. It was freezing snow wind, right? And my yeah. wife's like, my wife's like, did you get the sweet iced tea? And I'm like, I was freezing to death. <laughs> I forgot the sweet iced tea. I'm forgive me. And she goes, I have to go get sweet iced tea. I can't eat without sweet iced tea. So then my wife like risks death <laughs> to go at 11 p.m. to get sweet iced tea, not just good sweet iced tea, yeah. McDonald's one dollar sweet iced tea. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah. So I literally thought like I'm like gonna be a widower with like you know raising my child, and then I explaining explaining on the podcast I lost my wife frozen, like in Virginia to get sweet iced tea. Wow. So you should de- you should definitely have her on the show. No, no, we really would. I, well, I mean, that's well, sincerely. Wajah had the, folks, Wajah just gave us the trailer for uh, an upcoming episode. So <laughs> that's, Tony Randall here giving you a trailer for the upcoming episode. <laughs> I'm, I'll, I'll be waiting in my pajamas if Sarah if Sarah says no I'll be waiting I'll be waiting staring at the wall coming in as no, the I, 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 I guest I think we've dropped Tony Randall's name more perhaps in the last hour than he's than his family has yeah. in the last yeah, yeah, yeah I was gonna say since he died yeah but yeah. Uh, what, what Jonathan, as we as we kind of wrap yeah. things up uh, where can people find you online I know you are omnipresent people can't escape you online but uh, why don't we uh, get, get, yeah. I, I'm I'm like the auntie Sari Ghosh at weddings. I'm omnipresent. No matter how much you want to look away, you can. I'm everywhere. <laughs> I'm not even gonna bother translating that because if you didn't get it, you're not gonna get it. So yeah, it's true. It, it, it's, 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 it's the beautiful voluminous flesh that hangs out of the Sari of uh, South Asian aunties. Uh, and they try their best to hide it, but they can't. So after a while, after a certain age, they like just F it, and it just rolls. It literally just rolls. <laughs> literally and literally just rolls. And, it's not uh, even – we're not even talking muffin topping. This is a whole no. different yeah. – yeah. This is muffin base, muffin top. <laughs> it's everything. It's, uh, so that's me. I, I am the I'm the Sari Ghosh of uh, Muslims <laughs> online. I'm everywhere, inescapable. You can find me at, on Twitter, at Wajahat Ali, and I Facebook a lot of stuff publicly. And uh, our show is every Tuesday and Thursday at 12.30 p.m. EST. And the cool thing about the show, it's a talk show. But really, sincerely, it's a social media-driven show. So if you yeah. have Twitter, if you have Facebook, you know, I'm the guy who brings your voice into the conversation. So you can uh, tweet at us at A-J-A-M-S-T-R-E-A-M. That's at A-J-A-M-S-T-R-E-A-M. Pitch me ideas for shows. Pitch me guests. And uh, give me your comments. I'll try to bring them on air. That's awesome. And, and I, I, I need to point out that, that Wajah had invited me on uh, to be a, a panelist a, a little over a year ago, and I got to talk to Max Brooks, who is a, a zombie oh, author. Oh, wow. So, I'm, I'm so, kind of jealous. I didn't so realize. I, I got to scratch that off my bucket list thanks to Wajah. That's right. So thank you for that. Um, World so, War Z fame, guys, for those who don't know. World War Z. He, he wrote the book that the movie was not based on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, but, but, again, big thanks to Wajah for coming Wajah, on. Uh, it's been a great – yeah, it's, it's really been great chatting with you. Uh, wish you all the best in life and the highest success. It couldn't happen to a better guy so um, no thank really, you guys and thank we are you, really proud you, of the work you're doing uh, really so uh, as we wrap things up real quick uh, just a reminder to folks you can reach us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com and uh, please do let us know how we're doing also write us a review at itunes and stitcher radio uh, also hit like on our facebook page which is facebook.com slash diffused congruence uh, you can also find me at the huffington post where my movie reviews go up regularly as well as this show and uh, on behalf of my colleague pervez ahmed and also our guest Rajahat Ali, this is zaki hassan saying Take care. We'll catch you next month.